Thank you uh, for joining me today, everyone. Uh, I'll just move on to my next slide. Given that you know the, the title for my talk, I will also provide a link at the end uh, so that you can find the, the paper that we're talking about today since it has been published. Okay, so the problem. So I'm a clinician by, by background. And so um, the issue of statistical significance, you know, not being the same thing as clinical significance is something that I live and breathe every day. You know, the question is, um, you know, what does this study mean and, and should it change my practice? Uh, the problem being, as you're all familiar with, that, you know, a number of different uh, outcomes are presented as, you know, continuous, um, you know, scale-based measures. Um, and, and so since there's so many of them, often when we're trying to combine them in a meta-analysis, um, we have to drive, you know, standardized mean differences um, and then figure out a way to try and explain those to people. Or even if we do derive a mean difference, uh, because they've all reported the same scale, the question can sometimes be still, you know, what does this mean? Because there is no published minimum clinically important difference value. And so then the challenge becomes, you know, how to explain results to patients and, and other knowledge users in a way that is meaningful for them. And so uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with the concept of a minimum clinically important difference. Uh, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, it's that threshold above which we would perceive a difference in an outcome on, on a scale. So for example, if a scale has, you know, 30, 30 points, um, you know, it might be that someone has either studied or, or said based on expert opinion, you know, the minimum clinically important difference is, is two, for, for example. There are different approaches to uh, deriving these minimum clinically important differences. The first being, of course, the, the anchor-based approach. So that's where um, you compare the uh, difference in a scale-based outcome measure to either sort of a patient reported outcome, which might be a global measure of change, or to some kind of external criterion, which, which could be ex, uh, expert opinion. The problem, of course, uh, being with those things, you know, experts or, uh, you know, if you're going to use the expert opinion based approach being that, you know, we're influenced by our most recent cases and extreme cases and just our practice in general. So there is an alternative approach, uh, uh, you know, distribution-based approaches, where instead uh, we look at the, um, or we compare the difference in a scale-based outcome to like a pre-specified um, sort of threshold level of uncertainty uh, for, um, for, that, for that measure. And so what we're going to try and talk about or answer today is, you know, can we improve the estimation of minimum clinically important differences with knowledge synthesis methods that will help make our meta-analysis results more interpretable? And so our objectives are to describe an empiric example where we applied a distribution-based approach using data uh, that was collected as part of a systematic review that I'll provide more detail about to derive uh, an MCID for our outcomes of interest. And then we're going to compare the derived MCID values to published MCID values, um, which is why I use this example specifically, because as I said, there's a number of scales out there for which we don't actually have published values. So this was a really good opportunity to, to compare, to compare our approach with published values. So the data set that we used was uh, actually from a published systematic review and network meta-analysis where we looked at the comparative effectiveness and, and safety of cognitive enhancers. So medications that we use for treating Alzheimer disease or, or other dementias too, but in this example for Alzheimer disease. And we included all, um, parallel randomized trials that reported a baseline mean or mean change value for two scales, the MMSE, the mini, which is the mini mental state exam, or the 11 item version of, of the ADAS COG because there are different versions. Um, and then those values had to report a standard uh, deviation or something that we could approximate it with. Uh, and then the number of participants in each study arm. And so this is just the you know, standard um, equation for pooling, um, or it can be used for pooling standard deviations. It's based on the uh, Furukawa uh, paper reference at the bottom. And so here it just, you know, NI is the number of participants for trial arm, uh, SDI is the standard deviation value for trial arm. And then if you're going to use this to try and calculate uh, an MCID, a minimum clinically important difference, then you, know, you can multiply that pooled standard deviation value by um, 
a range or a single value uh, that might represent a clinically meaningful um, threshold of, of uncertainty. And whenever I looked in the published literature, you know, other um, empiric studies, it appears that, you know, most uh, published uh, MCID values fall within sort of 0 0.5 standard deviations, which is, of course, sort of a moderate Cohen effect size. Um, and it's uh, that the values of sort of 0.4 to 0.5, that range is thought to represent sort of clinically meaningful uh, changes. And so those could be values that, that we would look at. And so that's what we did. So in our primary analysis, um, these were our results. So I'll walk you through the table from, from left to, to right in terms of the columns. So the second column is just the number of randomized trials and a number of participants in, in each of our um, analyses. And then the next column over is the range of standard deviation values that were reported in the included studies. In the next column, you have the calculated pooled standard deviation. And then in the following two columns, you have the MCID values that were derived at 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 standard deviations. And then we derived separate values uh, when for when we included only the baseline, uh, when we pooled the baseline standard deviations, or when we pooled the mean change standard deviations. Um, and as you can see, when we use the baseline standard deviations, uh, the values are, are slightly slightly higher um, than, than when we use the mean change. And so those values, what I should say, were based on all of the included studies in that systematic review, which was for a network meta-analysis. So it combined many different treatment groups as well as placebo together. But as we know, sometimes we're just, we're, we're making a pairwise comparison. And so, you know, is this still potentially a helpful method if we're just looking at, you know, one or, uh, you know, two or three even uh, treatment groups? Um, and, and so then, here we, we demonstrate this. So this is for the MMSE. So if you'll recall on the previous slide, we have uh, using the baseline standard deviations, the range of sort of 1.6 to two, and then for the mean change standard deviations, 1.4 to 1.8. Uh, and you see they're, they're generally quite, quite comparable, um, which, is, which is good to see. So that you know, if you have smaller numbers of, of randomized trials, um, the method state may still, may still work for, for you. And then if we look at the ADAS COG, uh, that second scale that we were interested in, um, here are our results. And, and again, results are quite comparable, although I will point out, uh, in, in case you haven't seen this already, is that for the treatment memantine, if you look at the mean change standard deviations, um, that row, uh, the MCIDs derived at 0.4 and, and 0.5 are a little different from, from the other mean change uh, SD MCID values. And, you know, we wonder, you know, it's based on only three studies. And certainly there was one kind of outlying study there. And when that outlying study, when I removed that just to see what would happen, um, the values at 0.4 and 0.5 became much more similar to the other ones. And so it may be that, you know, if you have too few studies, the method doesn't work as well. And so how do our values compare to published values? And so that's what this table is trying to show you here. And so the second column uh, has published MCID values and the references for all of these are, are in the paper that uh, I'll show you the, the reference for at the end. Uh, and so as you can see, uh, the values do approximate the values in the published literature um, with a couple of, of exceptions that I, that I will point out. So one, you can see for the MMSE, if we look at the mean change SDs that we derived and compare those to published uh, MCIDs, you'll see there's one published MCID value that's really high, uh, that 3.72, um, so four essentially, because you don't have sort of like this, the way the scale works is it's one, it's like a point or nothing. You don't give someone like 0.7 of a point. Um, and so, but whenever I considered that, like one, it seemed high to me, but it was derived based on expert opinion. Um, but two, I guess if you compare that to these um, like measures of uncertainty, that's a very large effect size. So it almost seems a little bit unrealistic as, as well if I'm comparing it to, to distributions. Um, and then what we do see is with the ADAS-COG, if we look at the, um, again, the published MCIDs compared to the uh, 
NCID values that we derived based on the mean change standard deviations. Um, again, they, they are a little bit smaller as, as we've already alluded to. And again, we might be, it looks like maybe underestimating that upper end of, of the uncertainty range. Um, so it may be that the baseline, the, the values derived based on baseline standard deviations are in fact a little bit better than the, than the ones derived based on the mean change standard deviation values. Okay, so limitations. So, you know, this is, these are specific examples to scales of cognition in, in people who are trying to, you know, detect cognitive impairment and dementia. So it may, they may not generalize to all situations. And uh, what we didn't get into today is that, um, you know, I would suspect the distribution of uncertainty and, you know, there's so many factors that could influence the distribution of uncertainty um, or, or standard deviation values, which I think is why, you know, yes, it's better to use sort of a pooling across many, many studies to get a much sort of better sense of overall um, what's what's happening in the literature, but of course you can still, your results could still be influenced by the populations being included. And then in conclusion, so, you know, I would say maybe this is an approach that we can explore um, more in the future to see if it does generalize to, to other situations, and certainly um, it can, and it has already, because I've, I've used this method in a couple studies, helps to um, improve the interpretability of the results. And so uh, here's the, the reference. Um, and so I will thank my colleagues, um, RG, and, um, who's here, and then Dr. Andrew Trico and, and Dr. Sharon Strauss. Um, and that's my email and my Twitter handle.